OK, let's uh, define factorial. The number called n factorial and denoted n exclamation mark is n factorial equals n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. That is, we multiply all the numbers from 1 to n together. So, for example, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, which is 6. 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. I've not put in the 1 there because something times 1 doesn't make any difference, so I'm just having 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, and that's equal to 120. Now let's do another example of induction, and it's an induction uh, example using factorial. We've seen it already. We show that 2 to the power n minus 1 is less than equal to n factorial for all n in the natural numbers. OK, the initial step for n equals 1, we have 2 to the power n minus 1 equals 2 to the power 0, which is equal to 1. And n factorial is just 1 factorial, which is equal to 1. Notice that what I'm doing is I'm doing the left and right hand sides of the equation I'm interested in, I'm doing them separately so that it's entirely clear that I have actually shown that they are equal. So we've shown that the inequality is true for n equals 1. OK, let's do the inductive step. Assume that the statement is true for some k and n. That is, 2 to the power k minus 1 is less than or equal to k factorial. Then, for n equals k plus 1, we want to look at 2 to the power k plus 1 minus 1. In other words, we replace n in the supposed inequality by k plus 1. So 2 to the power k plus 1 minus 1, that's equal to 2k. Notice again that I'm taking the left-hand side, or rather a complicated side, and trying to compare it to the other side. So we get 2k, and that's equal to 2 times 2 to the power k minus 1. So now I've got it in terms of something which I've assumed already. I've assumed that 2 to the power k minus 1 is less than equal to k factorial. That's my assumption, my inductive hypothesis. And now I've got my expression, something to do with the expression uh, when we've got n equals k plus 1. I've managed to get out of that. I managed to tease out something involving 2 to the power k minus 1, something which I've assumed something about. So by the inductive hypothesis, that's less than or equal to 2 times k factorial. OK, then, then that is less than or equal to k plus 1 times k factorial, because 2 is going to be greater than or equal to k plus 1, uh, because basically k is always greater than or equal to 1. OK, so we can replace the 2 um, by the k plus 1 there. And then that's just equal to k factorial. So, the statement is true for n equals k plus 1, when we've assumed that it's true for uh, n equals k. Hence, by the principle of mathematical induction, the statement is true for all n in the natural numbers. Now, the method of writing down a proof by induction is simple, and you should follow this to, to make the, the proof entirely clear. First of all, announce that you're using induction, so the person reading it knows, OK, this, this is a proof by induction. Then do the initial case. In the examples I've shown you, that's taking two sides and then showing they're equal, but just taking the two sides separately. Third step is very important. State that you're assuming that the statement is true for some k. Writing out the statement to use it later is often quite helpful. Then, in part four, use the truth of the statement for k in the proof of the statement for k plus 1. Often this will mean breaking a mathematical expression into two pieces, one of which involves the case for k. Now, be sure to indicate at which point you use the inductive hypothesis. This is very helpful when you're trying to get feedback from somebody. So if you're uh, giving to a teacher to mark, then this is a, a good point to, uh, to put it in and say, well, this, this is where I'm using the inductive hypothesis. Because if you're using it in the wrong place, the, hopefully your teacher will be able to spot that and uh, correct you. OK, then once you've done that, uh, got the expression for the n equals k plus 1 case, you want to state the conclusion, by the principle of mathematical induction, the statement is true. That way, it's entirely clear that you know you've done it, it's finished, and the person reading it or marking it or whatever um, won't be looking and saying, well, it just seems to have stopped. I don't know. Does this person really know what they're doing? 
But by stating the conclusion, then you really do show that you know what you're doing. So the reader knows the proof is over. OK, let's do another example. Recall the definition of the binomial coefficient. The binomial coefficient is n choose r is n factorial over n minus r factorial times r factorial. For 0, less than or equal to r, less than or equal to n. So this number does actually get used, for example, when expanding out the powers of a bracket involving two numbers, say x plus y to the power n. Uh, also gets used a lot in statistics when you're doing probability. So I'm assuming that you've met this binomial coefficient before, but imagine that we hadn't seen it before. How, how can we think like mathematicians and, and explore this? Well, we should try some examples. So 4 choose 2. That's 4 factorial over 4 minus 2 factorial times 2 factorial. So that's 24 over 2 factorial times 2 factorial. And so that's 24 over 2 times 2, which is 6. OK, and we can do another one. 8 choose 5. That's 8 factorial over 8 minus 5 factorial times 5 factorial. And we can do a little bit of calculation here, as you can see. And then that will come down to being 56. Note that in both cases, even though the definition involves a fraction, the final number at the end turns out to be a whole number. OK, and if you want to explore things, you should always try extreme cases. So what happens if one of the numbers is 0? Um, or what happens when you've got two numbers the same? So 7 choose 7. Um, we end up with 7 factorial over 7 minus 7 factorial times 7 factorial. And then we have 7 factorial over 0 factorial. Now, uh, I don't have time to explain why 0 factorial is 1, but it is actually uh, equal to 1. Try it on your calculator, 0 factorial equal to 1. And then later on, try and find out why uh, that makes, makes a decent definition for 0 factorial. So we end up in the end with uh, 7 factorial over 7 factorial, which is equal to 1. Similarly, 11 choose 0. 0 is an extreme case. It turns out that we do the calculations. That's equal to 1 as well. All this gives us a feel for what the binomial coefficient is about. And as I said earlier, one thing you may have noticed in the examples is that despite the definition involving a fraction, the coefficient is always a natural number. It's never a fraction like 1 over a half. In fact, this is true in general and not just for our rather limited supply of examples. So we've got a theorem. The binomial coefficient n choose r is a natural number for all n in the natural numbers. And all r, such as 0, is less than or equal to r, is less than or equal to n. So this is quite a complicated expression, but I think this is probably the most complicated that you're going to, going to see. So it's a, it's a good one to do. You can always pause the video at some point if there's something you're not sure about. So we're going to prove this using induction. There are other ways, but this is a rather nice way because it's, it's a lot, lot simpler. So let's do the initial case. Suppose that n equals 1, and of course r has between 0 and n, because if we go back to the theorem, you'll notice in there it does actually say that the binomial co coefficient n choose r is a natural number for all n in n, the natural numbers, and all r such that r is between 0 and n. So if you take, uh, you can't really have uh, are outside those uh, bounds of 0 and n. It, it doesn't really make sense, so we have to include that anyway. So um, what could happen? Well, r could be 0 or it could be 1. So there's two things we need to check in this particular case. Yes, n choose r is either 1 over 0 or 1 choose 1. Okay, We need to check both of these. That's simple enough. 1 choose 0, we end up with 1. And 1 choose 1, we end up with 1. So this... this uh, uh, statement that the binomial coefficient is always a natural number, that's OK in this particular case. So the initial case holds. Now let's do the inductive step. Now assume that the statement is true for a particular k. So we have our inductive hypothesis. The binomial coefficient k choose r is a natural number for all r such that r is between 0 and k. We now consider what happens for the case n equals k plus 1. The statement a k plus 1 is the binomial coefficient k plus 1 choose r is a natural number for all r such that r is between 0 and k plus 1. Therefore, we need to look at k plus 1 choose r. Well, it's true that k plus 1 choose r is equal to k choose r minus 1 
plus k choose r. And this is for all k uh, in the natural numbers, and r is between 1 and k. Um, if you don't know this, if you've never met it before, then try proving it. It just follows from the definitions. It's just a, a small calculation uh, to do. Uh, you can also see this if you uh, use uh, Pascal's triangle. This identity is called Pascal's identity. And if you look at how you calculate Pascal's triangle, you'll see that these numbers that, uh, that we've already mentioned, k plus 1 choose r uh, being equal to uh, k choose r minus 1 plus k choose r, you'll, you'll see that that's what actually builds Pascal's triangle. But anyway, let's just assume that this is true, or rather, let's uh, uh, accept that this is true. Uh, notice, however, that r is between 1 and k. Right? It's not between 0 and k plus 1. r is between 1 and k. We can use this identity, uh, k plus 1 choose r equals k choose r minus 1 plus k choose r, uh, where r is between 1 and k. We, we can use this identity uh, because by the inductive hypothesis, k choose r minus 1 and k choose r are both natural numbers. Now, if we take the sum of two natural numbers, that's a natural number. So therefore, using the identity, we have k plus 1 choose r is a natural number. It's a whole number, right? Now, we can't yet conclude that our original statement is true for all k. Uh, why not? Well, if we look closely at the identity we've been using, r is between 1 and k, not between 0 and k plus 1, as we would like for the statement a k. So, our argument misses out all the cases where r equals 0 and r equals k plus 1. So this is a little bit of a problem. This is not a great problem, though. We can quickly check that k plus 1 choose 0, is equal to 1, just by a minor calculation. And 1 is a natural number, so that's OK. You can check the statement uh, for r equals k plus 1 yourself. It's a nice, simple uh, um, exercise, just like uh, we've just seen there. So now we have actually shown that ak implies that ak plus 1 is true for all k. Therefore, by the principle of mathematical induction, n choose r is a natural number for all n in the natural numbers and 0. Uh, less than or equal to r, less than or equal to m. Note that in proving a k plus 1, when r equals 0 or k plus 1, we don't actually use the inductive hypothesis. We just found it holds by a straightforward calculation. That sometimes happens in uh, induction. OK, some conclusions. The principle of mathematical induction is useful for proving statements indexed by the natural numbers. Think of applying induction when you see statements indexed by the natural numbers. Uh, it's used extensively in mathematics. The idea is first prove that a1 is true, then show that ak implies ak plus 1 is true for some arbitrary but fixed k in n. I think this really is the key, the idea that you're, you're assuming that ak is true for some particular number. Okay? I think this is a big mistake that a lot of people make. They think, OK, I'm assuming it for all numbers. But no, you're actually just assuming it for one particular k. And then showing that when, when that's true, that uh, the AK plus 1 case is true as well. OK, then use the format for writing proofs that uh, you've seen. And remember, it's some K, not all K. OK, thank you very much for watching.